morning, Forest Hill family. Welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Michael Talercio, the pastoral intern of Forest Hill Presbyterian Church, and this is day 445. We're looking at Acts 4 today. I get to join you for a New Testament passage. I've been with you in 2 Samuel for a couple recent devotionals. Glad to be with you in Acts this morning. Let's ask for the Lord's help as we go to his word. Father, you're gracious to give us this opportunity to come before you and to hear from your word. We're thankful to see how your servants before us worshiped and served you in their time. And we pray that from this uh, morning's study of Acts chapter 4 that you would uh, encourage us to be bold as they were for your son's glory in his name through the power of his Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 4. I gave you a hint there in what a prominent theme in today's chapter is going to be. See if you can pick up on it, uh, this theme of boldness as we read together. Starting in verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than forty years old. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. 
And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, the number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold the field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. One of the things that it means to be a Christian is to be a herald. Not a Christian named Harold, but a herald, H-E-R-A-L-D. It's kind of an old word. We don't really use it much in modern parlance, but what it means is an official messenger bringing news. And that's what we see in today's passage. We see heralds, official messengers bringing news. And it's actually good news that they're bringing. In Acts chapter 3, we saw Peter and John heal a man by looking this, this lame man in, in his face and declaring to him in the name of Jesus, commanding him to rise up and walk. And that's exactly what he does in response. Jesus, faith in Jesus, as Peter and John clarify in that chapter, is that which has healed this man. And it invites the um, warm welcome. It's, it's, to a, it's to a warm welcome of the people of Israel that this healing has occurred. They're, they're excited to see this man walking around. It probably reminds them of the same kind of healings that were being done just a few short months earlier by Jesus himself. And now they're seeing it again, and it's these sort of miracles are being done in the name of that same Jesus. But Acts chapter 4 involves those very people who had a hand in Jesus's crucifixion, now hearing about these continued healings in Jesus's name, and they are not happy. The rulers, the elders, the chief priests of the people of Israel accost Peter and John in chapter 4 because of this healing. And interestingly, Peter and John have to kind of comically give a defense of this good deed they've done healing this, this man, they have to defend this good deed they've done as though they had done something evil because these rulers and these elders, these chief priests, they don't want Jesus to be in charge. They don't want Jesus' name to go forward. They don't want Jesus and his followers to gain a following. They want to be in control. And so they threaten these men. They try to get them to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. They, they try to put the kibosh on what Peter and John are, are doing. But they see, verse 13, that these are uneducated common men, and yet they are bold. They're boldly declaring what they know to be true. And they're astonished. The, the rulers of the people are astonished at what they're seeing. And they're, they're astonished at the way that Peter and John are declaring the truth about who Jesus is. Because they're not only saying that Jesus was crucified and raised, but they're indicting these very rulers in the process. They're, they've said in verse 10, Peter says... Let it be known to all of you and to the, all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. And then, and interestingly, Peter quotes 
uh, or alludes to Psalm 118 there when he says, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And Peter will actually label late, later pick up on this same passage in, sec, in 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, this very same uh, text of scriptures from Psalm 118 to talk about the, the temple, uh, the, the church really, being built on the cornerstone of Jesus, the stone that was rejected by the builders. So Peter and John here are being used by God to help build up his church. And that's why we see the church growing up to 5,000 people in today's text, today's chapter. Um, he's using them to build up the church, but it's through their boldness. It's through them declaring what they know to be true from the word. That there would be a servant who would be rejected, a cornerstone who would be rejected by the people of Israel and killed. And that that, that servant would become the cornerstone. That that one, that, that man, Jesus, would become the cornerstone on which God's church would be built. What the church needs, what the world needs, in fact, are men and women who will look people in the eye and say that your sin is what put Jesus on the cross, that you are guilty before a holy God, and your only hope of salvation is in Jesus Christ, who died, who was rejected by men, but who became the cornerstone of a new family for God, a way to be brought back into right relationship with the God who created us all. That's what the church, that's what the world needs. We need people who will boldly say that, unapologetically, without wincing and without fear of rejection. But that's a tall order. And so we're going to need to go to the Lord and ask for his help to be who we ought to be, who we really, in fact, are as born-again Christians. We are are those who are meant to be heralds. That is our calling. That is our job. But we need the Lord's help. We need his Holy Spirit to convict us of that and to remind us of that and to refresh us in that reality in Jesus, the one who has provided salvation for us. When we feed upon the love and the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf to forgive us, to restore us, when we dwell on that, when we think on that, that's what will enable us to declare truth to others in love and in boldness. Let's ask for his help as we, as we come to a close. Father, thank you that we've had this time in your word to just reflect on what it means to be your people. It's a word that is a bit prickly, Lord. It's a word that's hard for us to hear because it's such a high calling for us to not be afraid, for us to be bold, for us to declare without apology what you have revealed to be true in your word, that Jesus died as a result of wicked people like us crucifying him. He died according to your plan, O Lord. It, it was according to your will, just as it says in the passage, that there were gathered together against Jesus, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and and peoples of Israel. It was it was according to, to, to your plan to do what your hand and your plan had predestined to take place, that that, that happened, Lord. And it is, it is because you are in control of all things, and you rule even over the, the wicked hearts of sinful people like, like us, Lord, we, we can, that we can have hope, Lord, that we can have a sense of purpose. So we pray, Lord, that we would be refreshed by that truth, and that we would Come to the to the ruler of of the of the world, really, not just the church, but the world with humility, that we would kiss the sun, like it says in Psalm two. Lest we perish in the way. May we call others to do the same, Lord, unapologetically and boldly, and in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to say as we close our time out that we didn't quite get to the last section of our text. So my hope is that whether it be I or Pastor Jason who leads the devotional on Acts 5, that will make that necessary connection there between the end of Acts 4 and 5. And, and we'll mention, we'll, we'll at least comment on why Jesus isn't at the end of Acts 4, why, why the Bible isn't calling God's people to be communists, that there's more to it than a, a, 
a, a reading of the text that suggests such. And hopefully we'll, we'll see that as we look at Acts 5. Hope you'll be back with us for that passage. Uh, but before then, hope you'll be, be with us for our continued look at 2 Samuel as, as we continue uh, walking with Jesus through the Word. One chapter per day tomorrow.